The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Nope, oh, too much. Ah, there it is. Got to get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you? And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. W-P-H-A-T. You're listening to the number one health and wellness podcast. The place where health and consciousness connect. Perfectly Perfectly healthy healthy and tone 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 radio. radio, radio. With your host, Darren McDuffie. And now, prepare to get fat. What's cracking peeps and welcome back to the last episode of Perfectly Healthy and Toned Radio. I'm your show host, Darren McDuffie, and really this is not the last episode, but the last episode rather for 2016. Recharging my batteries, just taking the month of December off again to take a break and get ready for 2017. I got a lot more in store for you as far as getting more things out there in the health sphere and also intertwining that with consciousness. It's my personal belief that health and consciousness are thoroughly connected and once you get your mind right health soon follows so i'll be doing a lot more podcasts kind of blending the two of those genres if you haven't gotten a chance go back and listen to podcasts that i last uploaded with shannon garrett on hashimoto's talked a great deal about autoimmune thyroid and there was something on that podcast that we talked about that no one ever really talks about and it's what subclinical thyroidism actually is get a chance go back and listen to that episode and please share these episodes with someone that you know might need some direction in health and is looking for a little bit of guidance. Now today's episode is about hidden sugars. It's with a nutritionist by the name of Donnie DeSanti and we'll be talking more about his progression into really healing himself from ADHD and this is something that's personal to me as well because as a child I had ADHD but I was never really diagnosed. I just had a lot of times where I would never be able to sit still and and I also, like Donnie, is experienced really getting into a lot of trouble in school and somewhere along the way as I got a little bit older, I just managed it to turn around. I was never on any medication at all, but it's really unique and a really enlightening podcast to listen to. And if you have a child or you know someone who has a child, this may be something that they want to look into. So let me give you Donnie's bio. A self-proclaimed nightmare child, Donnie DeSanti experienced frequent detentions in school until he was finally diagnosed with ADA. He was put on a daily dosage of Ritalin and told he had a chemical imbalance which contributed to a learning disability. While taking Ritalin, Donnie's grades improved and he calmed down, but inside he felt embarrassed and broken. It was in high school where he would soon be inspired by a woman who had reverse cancer through a change in diet and lifestyle. Through trial, error, and constant research and support, Donnie has now been medication-free since 1993. You can visit him at DonnieDesanti.com. Donnie DeSanti, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. How are you, man? Doing good. Thanks for having me, Darren. Thanks for coming on, man. Um, really excited about getting to talk about a new topic as it relates to you yourself and you have real life experience with this. And one of the things that I always ask people who come on the show is to kind of give their experience and how they got into health. And you have a really unique story as I was preparing for the show uh, the last couple of days. I uh, I read your story and I was amazed. It sounds a little bit similar to my story, but I never got any treatment for anything. But tell your story and why you're so passionate about the subject that we're we're going to be talking about today. Sure thing. Yeah, I I mean, I guess health for me started at a pretty early age. Uh, I was kind of a nightmare of child growing up and, you know, kind of bouncing off the walls, had a tough time sleeping, super hyper, uh, never really sit still. And, you know, being the first child in the family, my parents just thought, well, well, that's just how children are. And it wasn't until about the fourth grade where, you know, my teachers started to really, you know, kind of say something about it and, and reach out to my parents and be like, you know, your, your child is, he's pretty tough to, to, to control and have some behavioral issues. And obviously my grades kind of reflected that as well. And the school started to kind of get involved and in doing tests on me. I was always kind of meeting with like psychiatrists and things like that. Hey, what do you see in this picture and, and all this stuff? 
And uh, eventually I was diagnosed with ADHD, uh, which is attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Uh, it was kind of rare, more rare back then, pretty prominent now. But um, back then, I think there was only one other kid I knew of that had it. But soon after I was diagnosed, they put me on a steady uh, dosage of, of Ritalin medication, which, you know, for me kind of worked in, in that it, it just just calmed me down, like super calmed me down, almost to the point where my dad was like, wow, he's like almost drooling on himself. Mm -hmm. Like he's so relaxed now. But uh, the the thing was is, you know, it seemed to be working because now I'm starting to get good grades. I could pay attention. Uh, you know, I wasn't misbehaving in class. Teachers were like, oh, he's, he's a joy now. And, uh, you know, all these things that were kind of, you know, symptoms seemed to, to fade away. But for me personally, I hated it. I hated the way I felt. I felt embarrassed with it. Uh, it just it just I felt kind of numb about it. Uh, this kind of went on for a good seven to eight years, and I never really told anyone about it, never told my friends, kind of kept it uh, you know, under wraps, uh, just because I hated taking it and, and hated what it, what it kind of did to me, I, I guess. Uh, and then it was in high school where, where I heard a, a woman came into to our high school and, and gave a talk on how she pretty much reversed her breast cancer uh, through natural methods, you know, really into – alternative therapies and, and, and really kind of changing her diet. That was really the, the key talk to about it and, and things that kind of affected her and stuff like that. And that really kind of struck a chord with me. I, it really caught my attention, which was kind of hard back then. But uh, I, I was just thinking like, hey, if this, you know, this woman reversed her cancer, you know, through, through changing, you know, what she was eating, like maybe I could do the same thing with, with kind of my disorder. So I really started to kind of dive into it and made it a point to like, I want to get off this medication. And you know, talked to my parents, my doctor, and they were supportive of it. And, you know, I started to dive in, like, how can I become like the healthiest version of me, right? Like, how can I become super healthy, you know, and obviously started with what was on my plate, and just started trying to eat healthier things. But the one thing that I really found was that for me, what really set me off was sugar. Okay, if uh, you know, anything with, with sugar in it or artificial colors or artificial flavors, it was kind of like a light switch in me and it just set me off. I would have a tough time concentrating. I would just be kind of off the walls. I would, I would be up all night. Uh, I always said that if I ate something that was red, kind of like artificially dyed red, it was I was up for days. And, and that was kind of like where I started and, and I started to really just cut out things with sugar in it, you, you know, your basics, you know, your, your cookies and, and ice creams and cakes. But the more I started to kind of get into it and, and right away, I started to feel better. I, I was able to concentrate more, uh, and, and, and had better energy, um, you know, more sustained energy, really not kind of off the wall energy. But the more I kind of dove into it, I, I started to find out that sugar wasn't just in these kind of basic things that we, we knew about, right? Like the candy and the sweets. It started to kind of you know, it was kind of spread throughout a lot of our foods. Um, it, you know, the more I started to read ingredients and labels, you know, I was finding in things like you that things you wouldn't even uh, assume, like breads and and condiments and dressings. Uh, and the more and more I kind of dove into it, I, I found that it was just in it was almost in everything. Uh, and that really kind of, you know, that kind of opened. I, I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, started to kind of fan this fire of like of, you know, what it really meant to be healthy. Like, what if I started removing all this kind of processed sugars? You know, how good can I feel? And, and that just kind of set me off on this passion for health and, and really becoming the healthiest person I can be. And then by doing this, I started to just attract more people to me, asking me questions about, like, how do I get healthy? And, and that's kind of led me where I am today, where I, I'm coaching people now and really helping them rescue back their health. And, and understanding what it really means to be healthy and, and understanding what the body needs to to be healthy. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell there, Darren. Yeah, um, I want to ask you this and just get your opinion. You were on Ritalin and you said that it didn't make you feel the best. You felt embarrassed uh, around people when taking it. Mm -hmm. How much is this because I think I, I just saw a documentary on Netflix called Prescription Thugs. Yeah. And there was a woman on there who was taking her daughter's Ritalin. She started taking it as a way to kind of revive herself. She was tired during the day. And I'm wondering how much with kids, how much is this more of a gateway drug? Do, do you see or 
Have you done any research? Mm -hmm. Whereas you're looking at kids who are on Ritalin, do they go into depression and take depression medications later on in their life? Do they get into more recreational drugs? What's your opinion mm -hmm. on that? <clears throat> yeah, like I said, when when I was diagnosed, uh, you know, there was like one other kid that I knew in in this in class that that had it. You know, I secretly knew he had it. Um, and but now we look at it with with children. We have like classrooms dedicated to you know children with kind of learning disabilities. Uh, we have more you know options now for not just Ritalin but but other kind of uh, you know. Uh, what are they, uh, and attention kind of enhancers, so to say. Uh, it, so it's definitely it's definitely uh, increased, I would say, tenfold. Uh, you know, of, of the diagnosis, and and who knows with that. The, the, here's the thing with with ADHD and something like this is there's no real like you can't just pinpoint it, right? You can't be like cancer. You can be like, well, there's the cancer, right? With ADHD, you know, it's symptoms, right? It's, it's, well, they're showing signs of symptoms, but I, I mean, that's tough, right? I mean, what kid doesn't pay attention, right? And, but I, I think it, it's also, I, I think also what's affecting this, what, why we're seeing such a rise in this is, is it goes back to the food system as well. Our food system, you know, is, is it's become, it's almost becoming worse and worse. Now we're having all these kind of uh, preservatives and ingredients in these foods that kids are eating so they're having these kind of chemical reactions uh, to these foods that are that are producing these kind of symptoms where they can't sit still right and so uh, you know now we have more and more kids taking these medications and and there are some kind of there there, there, there have been some studies showing that these you know they're, they're kind of changing up the chemical balance in the in the brain uh, which could be leading to things like anxiety and depression things like that so we don't really know the long term effects of it either right uh, and and things like and I, I've seen it just in with with you know younger kids and and in colleges I mean the readily available things like like Ritalin I mean they become almost like the the drug now of choice. Right, because you know, for people who are calm already, Ritalin has the the opposite effect. It kind of gives them that energy. For me, who had too much energy, it calmed me down. Right, so it kind of it's almost like an adaptogen in a way. So, you you know, it's things have changed a lot since when I was diagnosed, and and we have you, you know we kind of have an epidemic with it, and and people are having a tough time, you know, calming down, sitting still, uh, you know, attention with children, behavioral issues, and I think a lot of it has to start with you know, the food that we're giving our, our children and, and, and what we're seeing now is this kind of overconsumption of, of things like Ritalin. Going back to diet and just talking about that a little bit, I want to kind of carry this into adults because adults seem to carry the same eating habits into adulthood as they were mm -hmm. with kids. I know people who are still eating things like Frosted Flakes and crunch, right, right. crunch berry cereal <laughs> right. and things like that. And the average kid's diet, when you look at the average kid's diet, most of the time they're getting up and they're eating cereal in the morning. Mm -hmm. They're eating um, things that waffles with syrup and, and all kinds of stuff. And most of the time the waffles are processed. They're not being made by the parents or, or whatnot. Right. They're, they're coming out of a box. But I guess my question is, how much of this are we carrying into our adulthood from being children? And how is this affecting our brains if we never really take the time to, to, to look at labels and see what's in our food? Yeah, you know, it's uh, I think we're, we're at a, a point in kind of our, our culture where there, has, there, there needs to be a shift right in in kind of our habits. Um, we, you know, growing up you know, talking to my grandparents, you know, they were a culture where most of the stuff that they ate was stuff that they made in the house, right? A, a lot of stuff was made from scratch. Uh, they grew up in neighborhoods where, you know, they, they, a lot of kind of their, their whole neighborhood, they all had like their own gardens or they knew the butcher. They, the, the supermarkets were a lot smaller than, uh, right? They, they had a, a kind of a, a tighter connection to where their food was coming from. Whereas where we're at now is we're, We've become very removed from our food system. First of all, first of all, we're in seems to be in, in, everyone is in a hurry now, so we don't have kind of the skills to be able to prepare a decent meal, uh, a kind of a healthy meal. So we we kind of, you know, 
negate to something that's quick and convenient, but not knowing that 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 food is just not it's not just any old food. It's just it's kind of man made processed food, and the 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 side effects of that is we have things like you know loss of energy, uh, weight gain, uh, you, you know all these kind of getting sick, you know all these kind of uh, side effects of these kind of processed foods. So I think what really needs to happen happen is this kind of change in habits and, and kind of a relearn kind of what it what it takes to kind of be healthy and maybe even just to kind of what it takes to kind of just prepare just a, a decent healthy meal because we are seeing this kind of this kind of ripple effect from you know our kids are growing up and yes they are kind of kind of taking on the habits of the of the parents but the parents don't really know how right they were never really taught so what we're happening is generation after generation is kind of carrying on these habits, uh, and it's not their fault. They just don't know how, right? And and we're seeing now generations after generations are carrying on the same symptoms and disease. We have things like diabetes are running in the family. You know, heart disease, cardiovascular issues are running in the family, mostly because generations are just carrying over the same habits from from each generation. And I think there needs to be kind of a shift and be like and, and be like. You, you know, this is how you prepare something that's healthy. Here's here's other options. Here's here's how to read a label. Here's what to look for. Um, and I think when we do that, little by little, we can kind of change the pattern that's happening with with a lot of these generations. Yeah, that seems to be like the sticking point for a lot of people because I just had one of my relatives maybe a couple of weeks ago asking me what to eat. Why but, is it that we don't know what to eat? Right, right. Yeah, you hear that a lot, right? Yeah. And it's, what do I eat? And it's such a, it's such a broad question, right? Like, where do you start? And and here's the thing: it's it's so confusing for 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 a person. I understand the frustration. You know, I work with these people who are so frustrated, because you know our supermarkets now are bigger than ever, right? You go to the so- to the store for like a, a jar of, you know, tomato sauce. You have you know, 20 brands to choose from, right? Like you, you mentioned cereal. I mean, there's literally aisles of just cereal. And, you know, so it, it's just, it's just, it's confusing for people. And, and I, as I mentioned, you know, back in our, our kind of our grandparents days, the supermarket was, was way smaller than it is now. You just didn't have as many options, right? So we're, we're kind of so frustrated in, in what to kind of eat that, you know, sometimes when we find something, we just stick with it. And that seems to be the kind of pattern for a lot of people is like, well, uh, you know, this, I, I like the way it tastes. This is kind of working for me. It's quick. It's convenient. Uh, it works. I'm sticking with it. And then when they're not feeling good, they kind of look to someone like yourself and be like, I need to eat something different. But what what do I eat? Um, and, I, you know, that's kind of where I come in. And, and I think just the, the basic kind of answer to that is to kind of to stick with kind of real foods. We need to really be eating more foods that come from the earth is really kind of in a nutshell where to begin to for that question. Yeah, a lot of people just eat out of habit and see sometimes Mm -hmm. where people will go to the grocery store and they just buy the same thing over and over again. And they never think that there's so many different things out there that you can eat, but they're so tunnel vision into just eating the same things over and over. How We're talking about just hidden sugars in foods uh, and how addictive is sugar? I know that um, years, maybe two or three years ago, I was lucky enough to listen to an interview with Robert Lustig and he was talking yeah. about this, you know, this subject, but how addictive is sugar and are we hardwired to enjoy sugar, Donnie? You know, uh, yeah, Robert Lustig, his, his, uh, definitely recommend your, your, your listeners to, to watch that interview on, on, he does or not the, the talk on that because he thinks it should be cons- kind of considered a drug, and uh, I'm kind of right there along with him because, uh, you know, sugar is something that I-, I feel is just highly addictive, and I see it just with clients. I mean, the first thing they tell me is like, "You're not going to take my like candy bar away from me, right?" Or "You're not going to take my evening ice cream away, right?" Because we're so it's just something that we enjoy so much, uh, and 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 here's the thing, it's. The, the manufacturers know we love it so much and know that it's so addicting. So why not put it on all these foods, right? It, you know, if we're looking from a business standpoint, if if we have these kind of sugars in it, it makes it taste good. It, it makes it taste great, right? So if a person's like, wow, it tastes so good, it makes them buy more, right? So uh, I, I think, you know, companies know this. Um, I think 
from just a kind of uh, you know innate instinct. I, I think we're we're programmed to to kind of crave sugar and want sugar because if we look at it kind of you know from a, a uh, you know, a scientific kind of evidence, you know, food gets broken down into into sugar, into glucose, into a type of sugar. Uh, and, and to our bodies, you know, that glucose is, is a form of energy. That, that's, that's fuel for our body, right? So it's kind of a primal instinct to crave sugary foods because that means calories to us and that means energy and that means survival of our kind of our species, right? So, you know, it, we're kind of hardwired to to kind of crave sugar. So, you know, I, I know a lot of people kind of beat themselves up in, in saying that they're kind of weak-minded or they, they have no discipline, that they, they just can't stop craving it. Well, it's it's kind of in your, you know, it's in your innate instincts to kind of crave sugar. Uh, and the thing is we need to kind of almost detox ourselves from it and, and, and start to kind of wean ourselves off of the sugar because I feel like it is very addictive similar to – you know, like a cocaine or heroin, it, we, we do kind of get withdrawal effects. Uh, I, I know, I think it was a couple of years ago, 60 Minutes did kind of a little expose on sugar. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, they, they did they did like a little CAT scan of, of a brain of an individual, just a normal brain scan, and, and then they, they added Coca-Cola to them, right? So they had a before and after. And so just a normal brain scan, normal as it is, once that person, that individual consumed some, something like Coca-Cola, they saw how the brain kind of lit up, um, this kind of almost euphoric kind of lighting up the same way as, as when someone would take cocaine. So we're, we're seeing actually in, there's evidence showing in the brain that we're getting the same kind of euphoric, almost opiate effect in our brain, similar to drugs. Um, and, and you see that. I mean, you can ask anyone, you know, people find a sense of, a comfort or security when they have, you know, something that's sugary or sweet. You know, a lot of people who are emotionally eating, they seem to to kind of crave that sugar um, because it is kind of uh, it's comforting to them. So I, I I definitely think there's this kind of addictive quality to sugar, very similar to drugs. Can we go cold turkey off sugar? Do you do that with your your clients when you're working with them? Just take them cold turkey off, or is there an acceptable amount of sugar? for us on a, on a daily basis? Well, you, you know, I, I think when, when people are kind of looking at sugar, they, they kind of look, well, that I have to go cold turkey. And, uh, you know, the good news is I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think we need to go cold turkey because here's the thing is, is sweet, okay, sweet foods, I mean, sweet is a natural taste bud. Okay, we, we don't need to get rid of sweet necessarily, right? Uh, I, I think the best approach to, 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 to kind of removing these sugars is first off, identify all these hidden sugars, right, and try to avoid them. But more importantly, let's let's kind of sub out, right, these sweet foods, right, this, this sweet taste bud with something that's healthier, right? Like we, we can all agree that fruit is is sweet, right? I mean, there's some delicious sweet fruits. And what if we replace it with that, okay? Um, what if we start to add, okay, all these good, healthy, nutritious, rich foods into the diet? What, what, I, what I find with people is, that a big reason we crave sugary foods is because we're deficient in so many nutrients and, and vitamins that the body's, uh, you, you know, the, these cravings that come up is the body's way of communicating with a person being like, hey, you're not giving us the food we need. And what I find with, with people when we start to add all this good food into the into their, you know, their diet and their body, uh, those, those sugar cravings start to diminish, right? So, so now instead of playing that restrictive game, we're, we're, we're substituting in healthy, sweet foods, sweet taste buds, Right, we're adding in all this healthy, nutritious, rich food, and the sugar cravings are going down. So I think this is a lot more of a gradual approach than just being like, "Hey, you know what? Stop eating ice cream and candy." Right? Like I, I tell my clients all the time, like, uh, forget about it. I don't care what you're eating, but I'm more concerned with what you're not eating. Right? Like, let's focus on that area. Let's kind of flood your day to day, your diet with all this good stuff, and then a lot of the times those kind of those you know sweet foods or those foods we know that aren't the best, they start to kind of diminish and, and kind of fade away. Or, or even, I, and I've seen this a lot, our taste buds start to change. And that really, that sugary kind of sweet food we used to like is almost like overpowering, right? It's almost like, almost chemically, chemical taste in, in a way. I've, I've heard that from a lot of people. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a better approach than just going cold turkey. Yeah, that's kind of funny that you say that, that our taste buds kind of change because I know people who are adults now and it's like, oh, I still don't like vegetables. I'm like, 
dude, your taste buds change. Maybe yes, the vegetables yes. you didn't like when yes. you were a kid, you may enjoy now. But again, it goes back to habit of things that we avoid. And there's some vegetables I did not really like as a kid, but now I enjoy them. But I pretty much ate every vegetable. My mom made us eat vegetables. Right. But, right. but there's not too many vegetables that I don't enjoy. Right. Uh, going back to fruit, Donnie, because a lot of there's so much controversy over fruit and fruit is fattening. What is your take on that as far as can you eat too much fruit? Because a lot of people in order to avoid sugar are going to substitute fruit. And I remember myself doing that when I started juicing. I would juice everything sweet. And then about 10 or 11 o'clock in the, in, in the daytime, I would fall into the slump because I was juicing yeah. oranges and sweet apples and all kind of other sweetening things. But what's your take on fruit? Can Can it be too much or do you have to kind of pull back a yeah. little bit on the fruit? Yeah, so I mean, it also depends your goals, you, you know, your health goals with, with fruit. But here's the thing with fruit overall, okay? Fruit is not the, not the problem, right? Like a lot of people like, will avoid fruit. It, it has sugar in it, and that is true. And it does have fructose in it, you know, a type of sugar. Uh, but but the thing is, is that we're not in kind of a health epidemic or, or an obesity epidemic because people are eating too much fruit, right? You know, the, not, <laughs> we don't have an obesity epidemic because people are eating too many bananas. Uh, however, um, you know, overconsumption, okay, in your case, you, you know, you're just straight juicing it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're putting it in a straight kind of, you know, sugar form, right? You're, you're removing the fiber from it. Uh, you, you know, not that juicing is, is, isn't good for us, but if you're just doing straight, you know, fruit like that, you're going to get a very concentrated dose of sugar. And that's going to that's gonna react the same way as kind of any sugary food. You're going to call it, see these huge spikes in blood sugar and, and, and eventually what goes up must come down and you get this kind of crash afterwards. But, you know, overall for a person who's trying to eat healthy, I wouldn't be too concerned with, with kind of the consumption of fruit. Um, you know, I, I think, you, you know, if – you need to be eating a lot of fruit, you know, to really kind of see those effects. And in the beginning, I, w I wouldn't really kind of be concerned about it because here's the thing with fruit is, is yes, there is that, that, that fructose in there, but it's going to be way different than say something like high fructose corn syrup that, that something that you might find in bread, right? It's, it's a completely different dosage, completely different kind of substance. Uh, the, the, the thing with, with fruit is there's so much other good kind of components in there, right? There's so many other uh, nutrients and vitamins and minerals, right? We have things like resveratrols and antioxidants in there um, that are so beneficial to our body. We just can't exclude it because there's, some, there's a type of sugar in there, right? It, it's, just, it's just too beneficial to our body. Uh, but if you are kind of taking it in, in large, large quantities, I mean, you're going to see the effects of it. But I, I, I think you know, the average person isn't getting anywhere near that. So, you know, I think, I think fruit's a great kind of additive, uh, you, you know, to kind of, especially if you're trying to get off that kind of the sugar cravings. Mm -hmm. With you yourself, when you were, I guess you were in high school or about to go into high school, what were some of the immediate effects that you saw once you started taking sugar out of your diet? You mentioned dyes as well, but once I wanted to kind of maybe touch on the sugar and then the dyes. What were some of the immediate effects mm -hmm. you saw as someone who was on Ritalin, who was diagnosed with ADHD? What were some of the things that you immediately saw when you started kind of taking that sugar out? Right, right. Well, you know, as soon as I started to kind of jump into it, you know, I started to wean myself off the Ritalin. So, you know, I really kind of had to pay attention to diet because uh, one of the, the things that I started to, to notice right away when I cut out the sugar was my concentration and focus because that was the big issue, right? I had a tough time focusing in school uh, and my grades kind of reflected that. But when I started to remove the sugar, that was something that, that I noticed right away was just I was able to focus a lot better, okay? And um, and just, you know, my, my mind was a lot more calm whereas, you know, when I had sugar, it, well, first off, it was tough to kind of concentrate but, you know, anxiety and stress really kind of stuck to me more. Um, and and that, that was another big thing too as well. I, I seemed to be a lot uh, less, you know, stressed out. You know, I didn't really carry around this all this stress with me because another thing, another side effect that I had or symptom that I had growing up was like I was always anxious and worried, right? Like stress was kind of, you know, I, I was always stressed for some as a kid too. I don't know why, but that was another kind of side effect too is when I removed the sugar you know, the stress kind of level just started to mellow out. I wasn't as stressed anymore. And another big thing too was I started to sleep a lot better, which I think also helped the stress as well because, 
you know, with sugar and me and going to sleep, it was just tough. I ha- always had a tough time falling asleep at night or staying asleep, and I'm sure that affected me the next day. So I would say those those big things right there, you know, stress levels, being able to concentrate, and, and definitely my sleep improved. Yeah. So sugar. And then you, you mentioned also food dyes, which I, I kind of wanted to touch on because I think especially with children's foods, um, I think a lot of parents are really unaware of that and how they can affect their child. And I saw firsthand uh, just I had a woman on a couple of years ago, um, Dorothy Rapp, and she was mm-hmm. big. She was doing this stuff way back in the 80s about food dyes and how they affected children and it was just so eye-opening to see that these kids could be the most behaved kids in the world and as soon as they encountered these food dyes they went berserk and they, they they showed it on tv and when you look at the normal kids diets and you look at the foods that they're eating the chips the breakfast cereals all the other stuff that's geared towards kids most of those things contain dyes Right. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's kind of crazy. Uh, and, you know, you, you I, I mean, the kids have it the worst, too, because you see things like, you know, grape flavored, uh, you know, pops, um, you know, or, you know, cherry flavored or strawberry flavored. And you look at the ingredients and there's no sign uh, of a grape or a strawberry in it. It's just, it says something like red number 40 or blue lake 20, you know, or yellow number five. And, you know, these are, these are, these are neurotoxins. Okay. These, the, we're seeing effects in the kind of the brain development when we're consuming these kind of artificial, you know, sweeteners and colors. Uh, and you, you look at someone like, like a young child who's still so underdeveloped you know, you're going to see a, a reaction to that. I mean, you see it at, almost at like any birthday party where the kids come in kind of quiet and you kind of introduce this foods and right away it's like a switch went on. It's because, you know, these 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 kind of ingredients are reacting with this young child's brains and the brain can't handle it. You know, the brain of a child is so underdeveloped, it can't handle this kind of overwhelming, uh, you know, it's a sensory overload. You know, it's it's almost like the the, the brain is not firing correctly. Okay, and so you know these are these are something to definitely be aware of, and and like you said, I don't think a lot of parents understand it. Um, you, you know the the kind of the ramifications of that. Uh, you know, as a as a child, you you want your, your your child's brain to develop gradually and you know healthy, and something like these can can definitely alter that, you know, drastically. With you. Um, and I can go into my own personal experience, but I, I don't want to talk about myself. But I just wanted to get your opinion on this. Are a lot of the behavioral problems that we're, we're seeing with kids, because I know I could never behave in school. I just had this thing. I just had to act up. But a lot of behavioral problems that we're seeing in, in the school system, could this be contributed to the sugars and the dyes in the foods? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think that's a discussion for another podcast there, but uh, I, I definitely think it's it's a big thing. I, I think it's a big chunk of it. Um, I, I think, uh, you, you know, our food system, especially for for children, uh, needs to kind of change. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I can just relate to that myself. But uh, you know, what what these children are eating or even not eating, I think, is affecting behavior. I, you know, I think the structure of schools. Uh, we're in different times now. I think learn, you know, teaching needs to be kind of different. The approach. I think all these are kind of, you know, weighing in on, on you know, children learning. Um, but I think, you know, setting them up with a good, strong foundation of what they're eating, uh, you know, definitely can stack the odds in their favor, uh, you know, to kind of to better learning. Uh, but I, I think it's a good, it's always a good place to start. You know, everything from, you know, what kind of breakfast are they getting, you know, out the door or, you know, what about the foods in the school system, you know, from snacks to you know, if they're serving cafeteria foods, uh, you know, these are all kind of contributing to it. And um, so I, I definitely think we could see some huge changes in, in the learning system if we change what's on a child's plate. Definitely. Okay. Let's get into some solutions, because I always like to leave the podcast with solutions on you know what to look for. When we talk about hidden sugars, a lot of times what I think people uh, think when they look at labels, if they read labels in the store, they're going to think Mm -hmm. that sugar is going to say S-U-G-A-R. And it's not always often that. What are some of the 
names that sugar hides under. Right, right. Uh, yeah, well, he, I tell you, these these names are always changing too. But uh, I, I think in general, if if a person, obviously, you want to look for that word sugar, right? But like you said, it, it is has been disguised in so many different names, and that's constantly changing. It seems like, but you know, looking for things like ends in, in syrup, right? Syrup, you know, we know syrups are are, are, are you know sweet, right? Things like corn syrup, um, that's gonna that's gonna be a type of sugar in there. Um, anything ending in in the letters O S E, okay, is going to be a type of, of hidden sugar. So we have things like fructose, uh, which is often in, in the form of high fructose corn syrup, right? Two of the, two of those words in there. Uh, sucrose, dextrose, you know, um, maltose. You know, you see how the, all those end in O S E. You know, those are going to be types of hidden sugars, and they're going to kind of react the same way as, you know, something. Like like your favorite candy bar, okay? They're they're going to kind of have that that same kind of effect. Um, another thing I always tell people to kind of look out for is to kind of uh, avoid those foods that are that are saying things like no sugar or low sugar or zero percent sugar um, or diet. You know, these are usually key words that there's actually sh- hidden sugars in there. Okay, I, I know it's kind of it sounds kind of contradictive, but. Um, you know, usually they're they're putting kind of alternatives in there because technically there is the word sugar is not in there, but they are putting kind of, you know, hidden sweeteners in there, uh, l- like the ones I mentioned. So, you know, just just those right there, um, if they a person can kind of look out just for for those kind of, you know, hidden words, you'd be surprised what it could do and and, and really how good a person can feel when they kind of remove those. You mentioned diet. Let's talk about um, real quickly because I think a lot of times when a product has diet on it, people kind of connotate right. that with really being healthy. And then there are some sugars out there that are what you would consider synthetic sugars or diet sugars. What should a consumer be watching out for with those? Yeah, that's another one to kind of uh, avoid in general. I mean, all those kind of they're, they're kind of of buzzwords right like diet and fat free and low fat and you know you have a consumer going in kind of trying to clean up their diet or trying to kind of get on a diet and they kind of just assume that that's that's healthier but what they don't realize is that that's usually kind of some type of you know uh chemical storm really is what that is and because they're, they're just putting in you know all these kind of preservatives and and like i said hidden sugars because you know the, these hidden sugars that are in there are, are the the flavor enhancers. It, it, it's what makes it taste good, and, and it might say you know something like zero calories, but the way it reacts to the body, it's actually going to cause you to become fat. It's going to cause you to gain weight, which is another irony of it too. Is like here's someone trying to to lose weight, and they're consuming these diet products, but they feel horrible, and they're actually gaining weight, uh, right? So. Um, you know, if you can just avoid these kind of labels and again, go back to like what I was saying, you know, sticking to like what's considered real food, you know, that food that you find in the produce line. Um, here's, here's the thing, Darren, for your listeners is, is just shop the perimeters of a grocery store. As much as you can do that, the better off you're going to be. It's kind of like in the middle of the grocery store where the, where the bad smells coming from. Uh, not that we need to avoid it completely, but the more we can kind of shop those perimeters, just the better off we're going to be. Because in in that case, we're eating real food. We're eating food that that came from the earth, uh, food that rots, right? And it's just going to do, uh, you know, it's going to it's going to help your health in a dramatic way. How much do beverages contribute to our hidden sugar consumption? Because I think, for me, a couple of years ago, one of the biggest steps that I made was to eliminate soda. I was never a water drinker. Mm-hmm. I was always a soda, soda first, juice first. Water was my last resort. If I was out right. in the sun and <laughs> I was exercising for a long time or whatever, then I would drink water. But how much are beverages playing in our hidden sugar consumption? Yeah, I, I think a uh, huge uh, because, and you're not alone with that, Darren. I, I met a lot of people who are like, "Wow, I, I, you know what? I don't think I've had a glass of water in like five years," uh, because there, there's so many other options out there for you know for things to drink. Right? We have things like sodas and juices, and, and now these energy drinks and sport drinks. Uh, and so it's just like, you know, why am I going to drink water when the, I have these tasty beverages? But the thing is, these you know, these are just big sugar rushes to our bodies, and they're causing huge spikes in in our insulin levels and our blood sugar levels, which are, are causing these huge chemical reactions. And what we're finding is, 
you know, as we consistently kind of consume these beverages, uh, you know, with within a year, we, we somehow see this this kind of an extra 10 to 15 pounds like that. Um, there, there's studies showing that if you consume these kind of beverages on a, you know, pretty like one to two twice a day, uh, you, you can kind of definitely guarantee an extra 10 pounds um, because here, here's the thing, as I mentioned earlier, is, is there's no fiber in these in these drinks, right? They're just pretty much pure sugar. And when we consume these, they go right into the blood system, right? They're, they don't need to be digested. And it's causing this kind of roller coaster um, uh, effect in, in our kind of our blood sugar. And, and what happens is it just causes kind of this chaos within our bodies, which kind of accumulates to, to sto- stored fat and not only kind of affecting our energy levels as well. Um, but, you know, I would say, and, and I'm sure you can kind of attest to this is if a person can kind of remove just, just the liquid part of sugars, okay. Consuming these kind of juices and sodas, um, you can, you, they'd have a dramatic effect just in, in weight and energy, uh, just by, just by kind of removing that. I always tell people it's better to eat your sugars than drink your sugars because you're just, a, you're bypassing digestion when you're, when you're just consuming these kind of uh, sugary beverages. Yeah, I would re- agree with you there because I know for me, when I made that decision and I eliminated soda out of my diet, I somehow got rid of that perpetual bloat feeling that it always yeah, had I'm sure. from the, the orange juices and the Cokes and the Sprites and all of that stuff. And a lot of people have no idea how that stuff just makes them bloat up. But yeah. um, sugar substitutes, I mean, you're we're, we're telling people about hidden sugars. We're going over um, how sugars affect us. Obviously, a lot of people out there are still going. We're coming up on the holidays. A lot of people right. out there are still going to want to have the cookies, the cakes, mm. <laughs> the pies. I know myself, I'm going to have me a sweet potato pie for Thanksgiving. That's just my thing. Yeah. yeah. But what are some sugar substitutes that people might use that are a little bit better than just the granulated white stuff? Right, right. Yeah, again, if, if we're, we're talking kind of real foods, what are those kind of sweet foods that are found in nature, right? So, so sweet alternatives, right? We have something like honey, okay? Honey, most people know where honey comes from, you know, f- from the nectar of bees, right? So, uh, you know, honey has a, a lot of kind of mineral benefits to it. It's rich in B vitamins, has some antibacterial qualities to it. You know, honey can be a good substitute. Uh, we have things like maple syrup, okay, the the sap of a maple tree. Again, kind of mineral uh, benefits in there, which are going to be totally different than something like just pure sugar grains, okay. Um, we, we have now, which has become kind of uh, more popular, we have something like stevia mm-hmm. or stevia, which is, a, you know, a, a plant leaf. If we're talking kind of pure stevia, uh, very low glycemic, kind of just, it's just a plant leaf, but but offers nice kind of sweet alternative. Uh, then we do, we, we get into things like, you know, sweeter, um, you know, fruits and things, some dried fruits, uh, dates, uh, figs, right, raisins, uh, even some of our, our sweet fruits. You know, these are going to contain information in, in these kind of types of sweeteners, which is, is not, you know, prevalent in, in something like just kind of raw sugar or, or sugar grains, right? And so we're, we're doing the body you know, not that we need to be consuming all the time, but like you said, we, we want to enjoy sweets, right? So this kind of can help kind of satisfy those sugar cravings, uh, but at the same time, we're not kind of almost poisoning our body. Uh, and, and like you said, too, you know, you know we, we are coming around the holidays. This isn't kind of a, a, a testament to like you can never have a sweet potato pie again, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's like, okay, so you have that slice or, or two slices, you know, like, but what was the, the rest of your day like? Was that also kind of laden with all these sugary foods and drinks? Or did you kind of set yourself up because, you know what, I know I was going to have that sweet potato slice tonight. So I did my best to kind of eat as healthy as I could the rest of the day, right? Um, I, I know a lot of us have this kind of 100% mentality where it's like, I need to cut out all sweet things from my life. And that's not the case, right? L- life is long and, and, we should enjoy things that, you know, that, you know, something like a, a piece of sweet potato pie, but it's, it's, you know, what about the rest of the day? You know, how, how are we kind of, you know, kind of uh, upgrading the rest of our day to kind of compensate for that? Yeah, you can use stevia. A lot of recipes I use stevia in. And sometimes I, I'm not a big coffee drinker, but sometimes I'll have a cup and I'll use stevia, uh, stevia in that um, yeah. as well. But I found like when I use stevia, 
in baking stuff, I can't really tell a difference at all. And mm -hmm. um, I like to use that. Um, dates, you mentioned, I love dates. Dates yeah, to me are, are really, yeah. yeah, they're really, you can, they really have a sweetness to them, but they're also, they taste good. They taste good as well. Yeah, and they're great. They're great desserts, and uh, right. and you know, you know what's great? Uh, our kind of our day and age now is there's so many great recipes online now. You know, especially with all these kind of networks and uh, you know people sharing recipes. You'd be amazed what you know if you look it up, what you can find just kind of like healthier alternatives to to certain you know desserts or things that we enjoy, and be like, wow, that's actually made with some real ingredients, right? It's not this like laundry list of of things like aluminum and, and things we can't pronounce and right and you're like wow I can make that and and, and the great thing is it, it tastes great you know they taste good and and you don't feel this kind of guilt and and horrible feeling afterwards when you eat it mm -hmm. yeah for Thanksgiving one of the things that I a practice that I adopted was just fasting because mm. I was never a really big breakfast eater but when Thanksgiving comes you want to indulge and sometimes I say you know what I want to have sweet potato pie or whatever and I'll fast pretty much that whole day until it's time to eat and then I'll enjoy it, and then there's no guilt around it but I don't feel guilty right. around things I eat anyway so <laughs> yeah yeah no 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 one should right yeah, yeah yeah food should be enjoyed yep but Donnie it's been great having you on um I don't know if there's anything that you want to add but I also wanted to uh, get your website out there if you can give us your website address your website is really neat really planned out i loved your website when i went on to to do some research on you and and find out more about you but uh give us your out thoughts and whatever else you want to add yeah uh, yeah just for the listeners you know it's it's all about kind of just adding real food uh just kind of relearning how how to to eat and, and understanding what our body needs it's all about that food from the earth the, the closer we can get to food that's from the earth just the better off we're going to be with our health and you'll be surprised it just naturally starts to cut out those hidden sugars so uh, i'll kind of leave them with that uh but people can get in touch with me if they, they go to donniedesanti.com uh that's d-o-n-n-i-e-d-e-s-a-n-t-i uh, or they can kind of jump onto Facebook. I have a nice little Facebook group going on called Life and Balance Tribe. Uh, some great health tips there that people can uh, really get some benefit out of. That's Life and Balance Tribe. Cool. Donnie, it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks for being on. I appreciate it, Darren. Thanks for having me. All right, great. Want entertainment designed just for you? Then check out customizable streaming TV from Xfinity. It makes your life simple, easy, awesome. Xfinity gives you customizable streaming TV options. Enjoy the most free shows anywhere on any device and even access your streaming apps right on your TV with X1. Go to Xfinity.com, call 1-800-XFINITY or visit a store today to learn more. Restrictions apply. Do you hear that? That's the sound of a roaring fireplace in every Cracker Barrel across America. And that? Traditions being shared amongst families and friends. And lastly, this. The sizzling of our new country fried turkey. It's a brand new take on a festive favorite, hand-breaded, fried till crispy, and topped with our holiday herb gravy. Because at Cracker Barrel, you don't have to be at home to get a taste of home. This holiday season, come on home to Cracker Barrel. Available at participating locations.